focus on for the next week or so. Story of the birth in a manger. That's the children's Bible story that we've learned and known for so long. And it's a story that we tell to our children that God for so, uh, so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son to come. As I spoke to you at uh, last, I reminded you of the centuries, in fact, the millennia of prophecy that prophesied that day and how it was came to fruition on the birth of Jesus Christ. But I also shared with you, as I have on the scriptures on the inside of your bulletin, the adult version of that Bible story of why Christ came, how it was the eternal plan from even before creation that he would come to be born, live among us, that he might have compassion and understanding of us, having lived in the flesh, suffered the pain, and died the death, that we might live. I kind of end on that last scripture there from 1 John, that he came that we might have life, life more abundantly, that we might have eternal life back in the kingdom of God as God had intended in the Garden of Eden. It's a wonderful story, either the children's version or the adult version, but it's a wonderful story, a story that has changed lives and hopefully changes ours. You know, I think about the wonder of what God has accomplished. I read about King David knowing because of the life he had lived that he was going to go to the prison house and be kept there. And his soul could not be released until Jesus came. And in his prayer in the book of Psalms, we read, he came to take my soul, to release it, and to restore it. In the book of Revelation, while we saw the angels here on the earth, the shepherds came, the three wise men, and they worshiped, there was a lot going on in the kingdom of God, in heaven. And it said that there was a war in heaven and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought against Michael. And the dragon prevailed not against Michael, neither the child nor the woman, who was, which was the church of God which had been delivered of her pains and had brought forth the kingdom of God and his Christ. And he said, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. For they have overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, that they loved not their own lives, but kept the testimony even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, that ye that dwell therein, therein This was an accomplishment of God. That is, we were enjoying the blessings of his presence here on this earth and the results of his ministry in our lives. Victory was being won for us in the spiritual realm of eternity where we will live with our God. You'll remember the story of Jesus dying on the cross and turning to the thief next to him that cried unto the Lord that he should save him. And the Lord said unto them, This day shalt thou be with me in paradise, not in the place which David was held and had yet to be released all the saints until that day. Well, we read in there that 
Behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, the rocks rent. But what else happened? The graves were opened, and the bodies of the saints which slept arose, and were who were many. And it came out of the saints after, out of the graves after his resurrection, and went to the holiest city and a holy city and appeared unto many. We know that Jesus went in those three days in between and unlocked the gates of hell. People we would have claimed were lost souls, never to be reclaimed. But with God, nothing is impossible. He loved dearly those there as he does you. And he even went to the depths of hell and unlocked that gate to reclaim them. He comes to reclaim you. And as you see him in the manger, let that be your hope. Let that be the light that shines upon you and calls to your heart to follow after him. I welcome you to our church and to our worship. May you uplift us and edify us as we worship together. You'll have to forgive me, Rita used this coal for about 10 days and then gave it to me. And I know God calls me to something higher than a human character or nature that's in me. You know, the human nature tells us that we think the worst of people, not the best. That we ascribe the worst motives to them, not the best. Even those we love. You'd think we'd be a little bit more mm, forgiving or giving the benefit of the doubt to those that we know and love, but sometimes they're the ones that we're the harshest with, isn't it? So God calls us to have more of a divine nature and to think, as he said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Mm, that's a challenge when your wife gives you her coal. But as my brother reminded me, at least she loves you, she's sharing with you. Maybe I ought to look at it that way. It's hard sometimes, but let us remember that we're supposed to love one another and look at each other as God looks at us. And maybe we'll realize the great value and preciousness he places on each of us. He was especially mindful of how precious the little ones were and reminded us of how much they meant to him. Let us raise them and care for them with great love. I'd like to share with you as we begin our worship, call on you with a hymn to that scene in the manger so we can begin to enjoy our Christmas story all over. 109.
Heavenly Father, we have heard you call our name, and we have gathered in your name to praise thee and to thank thee for the many wondrous and wonderful gifts of life that you so freely bestow upon us. Lord, we're thankful to be your children and worship you as our God. Be with us, bless us, stir in our hearts and minds the remembrance of your hand in our life that we might always remember your love for us. Help us, Father, to be your children and love those that you love and seek them out. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We have, let's, let's just see, okay, let's see what we got here. Boy, I sound, I sound awful loud today for some reason, don't I? <laughs> okay, so here's what we'll do today. So where we were talking last week, um, talking about a lot of neat things that are that are uh, the attributes of God and and who God wants us to be and how do we see God versus how do other people tell us how we should see God and so we're trying to get that clarity right that clarity. So and as I was telling you some of my journeys, I've uh, by the way my uh, his, his name is Scott friend. He's a I found out he's a. Uh, Independent Fundamentalist Baptist. No, 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 no. Independent Fundamentalist. Orthodox, Orthodox, Orthodox Baptist. And so he and I, we've been having some, um, what I would call interesting conversations about things. And so today, uh, earlier today, he decided that to, uh, you know, he, he doesn't believe that you need to have baptism. So we got into quite an interesting conversation with baptism and do you need it and all of those things. And, and uh, he thinks I am hooked on, and it's interesting, typical, I mean, it, and we can relate to this, right? So you share one or two scriptures, which we do. I share a lot of scriptures with him, actually. He picks up on one or two bits of those scriptures, he thinks that I believe, that we believe, that we're hooked on works only and not on grace. And it's, it's like, finally, Scott, Scott, where are you getting this? Out of all of our conversations about faith, grace, mercy, because I've been talking to him about the attributes of God, and he said, well, he goes, it seems like everything you talk about, you have to work at. I said, yeah. <laughs> you do. You have to work at it. I mean, it's, well, but we're just saved by a grace, Brian. And I said, yes, but, well, there's not a but there. But yes, there is. Because if you read your scriptures, your New Testament, your, uh, even, even the King James Version, it tells you that, you know, faith without works is what? Dead. Absolutely dead. And for some reason, I tell him that, and he just looks at me like I have just spoken Chinese. And I don't get it. I mean, and I try to be articulate, articulate being in such a way that um, uh, I, I try to be very clear with him. It's, it, fortunately, we're, we're good enough friends that we can go back and forth. And uh, because I tease him, he actually goes to a... He doesn't go to a Baptist church. He goes to like an evangelical church, which I, I said, how did you make that right turn then into theology? You know, I, you know, I listening and, and uh, so it's kind of interesting. He, he's praying for me, he said today, so that's good. So I, I, I guess I need that, which I do, I do. So what's that? You know, we do, and I told him, and I did tell him, I was very frank, and I was transparent with him. I said, you know, Scott, you're great fodder for my adult class. I said, because, I said, I too many people do I come across. He, and what I love about him, though, to be truthful with you, is his conviction. 
he is convicted. And, you know, if we were all as convicted as he is, it would be different. I mean, literally, the world would be different. He is convicted that his belief, he's strong in his belief, his parents raised him in such a way, he's just a couple of years younger than I am, um, and he's yet to smoke, drink, what did he tell? Oh, and then he really doesn't dance, which is, if you saw him, that's probably a good thing, but, you know, he doesn't do any of those things because of, uh, of his upbringing. Oh, he doesn't play cards either, yeah. So, which I thought was interesting, and, and, and uh, um, I said, so, what well <laughs> right and, and and so it, it was it, to engage him it's it's kind of interesting and i know he i just frustrate him you know he just i think he thinks he wants just to save me you know just save me like crazy but it's like uh uh Oh, you know, I, I don't, I probably do need probably saved. I guess it's from, from prob more from myself than from anything else. But it goes along what we've been talking about. When we talk about, uh, we're in the lectures of faith, and uh, do you folks have lectures of faith? You have you with you? If you don't, I have two for you. One for both you and your... Exactly. Right, exactly. No, no, that's exactly right. No, that's a great point. Yeah. By the way, I got... Exactly. That's exactly right. And by the way, I got into a discussion about the Sons of Perdition, which he does not believe in. Yeah. I, I'm not... That, that, and I point him to it, but he doesn't, he doesn't believe, which I find it, what's interesting, it's really quite engaging, frankly, because we can have a good conversation around it. Mylon? It's all a journey. Yeah. Yeah. Well, exactly, exactly. And as we've talked, so many of our blessings come from others as we embrace the Christian within us, you know, the Holy Spirit that guides us. And that, if you really think about it, that's exactly what the Lord wants us to do as we look at the two commandments, you know, to, to uh, love your neighbor as yourself. You have to have in that understanding of how Christ loved us and how God loves us. And that's why we have to truly understand how God sees us and how we truly see God. 
and, and although Scott doesn't know it, for me, he's proving uh, to me that we have a vision of God that is so many, so many times uh, somebody else's vision or a vision of Christ, who Christ is through other people's eyes or lens instead of our own, through our own basic testimony. And that is, that is very dangerous because does he, how does he ask us, Christ, how does Christ ask us to come? To him or to somebody else? To him directly. And so then what is the purpose of the priesthood then? Throw a curb at you this morning. There you go. That's a good way to put it. Signpost helps along the way to, yeah, because all, all are not all called to do what? Yeah, exactly. To be, to emulate, that's why we have, we have the very basic parables or stories we, and, the, and, and I believe in my heart of hearts that Christ put them in and, and they were divinely put in. All of these parables where Christ was showing us to be a light upon a hill, uh, the good steward, all of these things, though, revolved around helping who? Others than you. And that's the thing. When you read about all of the parables, stop, step back, read about the parables. Our, our, when we find that true heart of hearts, that true d deep burning of the Holy Spirit, what will you be motivated to do? That, the, the good point about Jonah. And what was that? Yeah, exactly. So how do you do that? You know, and that's one of the things that we need. How do we share the good news? I mean, I, I've given to the little red kettle a couple of times. I, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm almost up to a buck every bit of I'm being sarcastic. Okay. working at it. You'll get there. did. Yep. Right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But we all have that many times that. Yeah. Exactly. 
that's a great point. That's, and that's a great, great story parallel to what we're talking about, uh, Bruce Riley. Yes, that's true that they were. So we see though the point is the goal is 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 as we put ourselves within within who the who the Lord truly wants us to be, how and as we look at um, those things He calls us to do, it it should cause us to stop and reflect just a little bit on on uh, what we hear, what we say, and what we do. And, and the reason I bring that up in, in, that, in that manner is because so many times what we hear turns into what we do. And if you're not grounded the right way, you're doing things that you've heard that may not necessarily bring honor and glory to God. Do you see how easy that could work? Because if we follow, just like my friend this morning, you know, Scott, you know, he is, he is following, not, he's not doing anything wrong, don't get me, but he has... This, this stuff that's been um, uh, uh, ingrained into him by his parents. Uh, he, ha he does not, at least from what I've been able to tell, and I tease him a little bit about it, he is not willing to put some of that up on a shelf and then go through that period of discovery again of the Lord, what, what are you asking of me? He, you know, he follows, follows the words, kind of, yeah, kind of like that. Yeah, Bruce Chapin? Feels like work. <laughs> well, but to that point, though, you see, you see, if we can recognize it, we can understand it. So let's take a look in Acts, uh, the second chapter. And in Acts, the second chapter, uh, verse, we'll start with verse 32. And he, when, when, when it's, it's this sermon from, I think this is from Peter, is coming out. And he's sharing, and he's trying to explain who, who um, Christ is, right? He's trying to explain. you got to realize, we have a group of people here that what had they been following up until the time prior to Acts? What law? Yeah, the Mosaic Law, right? They, and, and, he, and so think about that. And we're talking for a long time. It's been ingrained. So, you know, there are certain times you go to the temple, you have your feast, you do this, you do that. So, now we have the prophecy fulfilled. Now, it's so easy for us to see it today, isn't it? We look back and go, oh, yeah, see? So, here, though, you're, we're trying to change. And so, what happens is Peter's here talking, and he's saying in verse 32, This Jesus hath God raised up, wherefore we were all witnesses. What does he say in verse 33? What is he trying to get across to the people there? Because remember, he didn't come in like they thought. Didn't come in with, didn't come in with uh, an army, or even though he was recruiting an army. What does it say in verse 33? Well, what, what is, <laughs> thanks for listening, just like at home. Um, therefore, you know, the we, we're married, by the way, just so you know, okay. She looked at me like, what the, are you talking about? So, what the question is, is when you, when, what, what is, what is Peter here trying to tell the people? What is he trying to convince them of? You know? Pretty cool.
that, that great explanation because that's exactly right. That's exactly what everybody had expected. So they're kind of going, well, I don't know. He didn't. Where were the where's the where were the armies? Where's our freedoms? Where's where are you know the questions were being asked of the followers are saying, well, you, you guys say this is Jesus, but where are the where's the, where's our freedoms coming from, Bruce? Right. So, to that point, then what he is saying, which goes along with our brother here, is the fact that Christ was here to free us from ourselves, which then would enable us to fulfill the mission. And that's true. Mylon. Well, right, right, need to share. But now, what kind of, what, what mindset must you be in to fulfill what you just said? Who do you have to be to fulfill what you just said? What will Jesus do with us? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. All right. Yeah, surrender our wills. So my grandkids submitted lists of toys. For who? Not for you. No. For, no. To us for them. Well, that's not a bad thing, but you understand, though, where I'm going with it. Where it, we're, we're, we're programming a thought of, well, give me a list, and I'll get you what you want. It's, but it's like that, and, and that's, that has become our nature, is if we, talk, if, we just, if we just look at the naked truth of, of how we are and who we are, we're able to clearly see how Christ sees us, and then move to that next I'll call it a next level, whatever the case might be. Because just like here, it says that, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost. Have you received the promise of the Holy Ghost? Yeah, absolutely you have. So, That becomes a whole nother class, but yeah. Has it uh, true? Has the same promise. Everybody has the same promise. Mm -hmm. Exactly.
Right. Right. Exactly. good that's a good way to put it a guiding versus inspiring and and is there anybody in the room that doesn't want more of that in their lives don't raise your hand by the way because you got to work that out yourself Bruce Chapin many times Now think about where that comes from when you take a look at many of the of the principles that are being preached or taught today it is that prosperity to my words prosperity type gospel where where you, if you do this you're going to get this you know and whereas if we do this it's through that that inspiration that love that, because if you love somebody what do you normally just do stuff for them and, and do you think twice about doing it you shouldn't I mean if you think twice then you know you put a little question but see that's the point where if we would should and could it would become so automatic for us and it's hard I mean if it was as easy as how I just spent those words out we we wouldn't we wouldn't have to worry about it but it's not and it takes work even for our own selves to make sure that we are fulfilling that what we do so I, I want to take us to um, um, lectures of faith Let's go into Lectures of Faith 4, and uh, when you get to Lecture of Faith 4, 18, and 418, and it talks about, you know, and this is where we had started here a few weeks ago, where it talks about the attributes. Well, the attributes line up to everything that we've been talking about. Uh, so when we have these attributes, so 418, and it talks about in view then of the existence of these attributes, what does it talk about then the faith of the saints? Right, and what else? So it becomes exceedingly strong, what else? Yes. For, for a reason, and what's the reason? What's that? Yes, to praise and glory of God. Now, when you back up and, and so how easy that statement is so if we say well I'll just read it in view then of the existence of these attributes which are you know previously we previously talked about the faith of the saints can become exceedingly strong abounding in righteousness under the praise and glory of God there's a lot in that very simple section right there because do you have enough faith or would you like to have exceeding faith I don't know that I know what exceeding faith is. I think I have a lot of faith, but to have exceeding faith, I, I would love to feel it. I mean, just exceeding faith. So that would be faith to me. My Brianism would be saying, that's the kind of faith when I walk in this room and I hit that switch, the light comes on. What's that? Yeah, exactly. And, and when you see this, that has to make you stop back up and say, okay, wait a minute, I gotta take a look at this differently. So, what does it say in B there, in 418B, after all of that had been said previously? What does it say? And it's a process. Who wants to read it that way? John, can you read it out?
think about the depth of what was just said there. So the faith become, you become exceedingly faithful. You abound in righteousness. Um, doesn't say you're perfect. So don't read anything into it that's not there, which we do. But said you're, you, you're, in which that takes you on a journey. Those two things, your faith, and it's a process, faith, righteousness, and then you begin to search. And you will search for that wisdom, and then with the wisdom, what else do you search for? Is there a diff What's the difference between the two? If you're wise, don't you understand? Bruce. Very good. All right, very good. That's exactly right. I think a lot of us, some of us or many of us know, but we don't know enough to when to use it or when to not use it. Um, it's like we're talking about loving our neighbor as ourself. Do, does that mean that we have to go around and we give our, every one of our neighbors a track? Is that, is that the way that works now? What's the best way to talk and bring ministry to our neighbor? Is to know them. Example too. But if you know your neighbor, now doesn't that sound like a scripture? To, but it's a campfire, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. And but doesn't that make sense? And that doesn't that fit what Christ? How when Christ came and He atoned for those sins, you know, we're kind of putting the you know the cart before the horse as far as the seasons are concerned. Atoned for our sins, but for that very same reason, He came to know us as we should know our neighbors. Some of our neighbors we don't want to know, right? Okay, I don't want to know my neighbor. You still have to. That's exactly right. So when we drop down to verse or the part 19, it's lecture 4, 19, you see then it goes on and it creates something else here. What else does it create? And, and what do we know, what do scriptures tell us about foundations in our lives? Is a, sand, bless you, is a sandy foundation good or bad? So such then is the foundation which is laid through the revelation of the attributes of God. For what reason? What reason? Pretty clear here. Very good, Janice. Yeah, for the exercise of faith in him for life and salvation. And that's important. That's important to note because it, it, you see the process and you realize when, when these, were, these questions were asked, it was a group of people much like us that sat down and said, okay, you know, if you know how these, were, how these all started. It's, it's, these are good, solid questions that, that after the church was established, for an example, they got together and said, you know, I have a few questions. And then as they began to study them out, these are some of the answers that came. Well, we see that um, we talked in 19b, what does it talk about and how are the attributes? Are they changeable or unchangeable? They are because it goes down to says, which gives to the minds of the Latter-day Saints the same power and authority to exercise faith in God, which the former saints had. It's interesting when we drop down to E, then who would read uh, 419E? Who'd read 419E? Yeah. yeah. Yvonne, you want to read it? John's prodding you there a little bit. <laughs> so see what question that, that, that answers? Everybody has an equal privilege. Milo?
think that's a good point. I understand exactly where you're coming from. Bruce? Interesting comment. That they that they'd repent. Yeah. Exactly. Good point. Brother? Right. No, that, and that's very good. Milo? <laughs> right. 
Right. That's a great, that's a very good point. Yes, that's true. Bruce Riley. Possibly, possibly. You know, the Lord will, will the Lord's work be frustrated? We'll be frustrated. Yeah, you know, we'll be frustrated with the work of the Lord because it won't necessarily be our way. And that's my point. So many times, what's that, Mylon? Oh, that's true. But let me ask you this question because everything I, I, I and I'm glad you guys are thinking through this. You guys and gals are thinking through this. So did. Did the people of Christ's time agree with all of Christ's teaching? No. Many of it was rejected. It was put, you know, put aside. Woo. Yeah. Yeah. They couldn't quite put their arm, their mind around. Hey, how, why are you doing that? Which, yeah. So when we see those things that take place. And we understand like what we're saying here, and we know that Christ didn't always agree, even though the times, um, like a brother said, the times are, I think they're the, very much the same. We just wear some different clothes today as compared to then. Same challenges. But if we back up, and what did, how did Christ then work within that system? What did he do? Think about the life of Christ. Now we have, and look at the impact. Three years of true ministry, and how many years later are we talking about it? So think about this now. How did he bring ministry to the people? What did he say to the woman at the well? What did he say to, to those that were going to stone the harlot? What did he say to the many that they he fed. Think about how he taught the message he brought. How did he teach? How did he work with the people? Bruce? Right, right. <laughs> sure. So how did he teach? How did he show? How did he, what example did he set? Bruce? Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Because when they do that, they become convicted. And, and that's the, that is the process, conviction of your belief. Instead, it goes back to wisdom and knowledge. You could throw scripture after scripture, which my buddy Scott, he, he, hangs, he hangs his entire, on, on a couple of scriptures in Mark, and which 
things. It's like, yeah, you, dude, you, there's a few million other, or a few thousand other scriptures in the book. You've got to hang your hat on something else. Bruce Riley? true very true uh so let's do this let's go back into your lectures of faith because it follows along with what we were talking about and but jump into five lecture five and and it, but because it, it talks about in lecture five turn to uh would be the third third paragraph third whatever in there uh b through d and that's how we'll tie this up today uh it could, what's that uh it's lecture five Five three, B through D. Yeah, lecture five. Y yep, these got the same books on page seventy five. Did they erase lecture five out of your guys' book? All right. So in three B through D, it talks about the atonement mediation of Jesus Christ. And, and it goes on to describe what that is. And, and so as we get close, as we understand the, the season and what we're going to do in a few days, um, you see the promises that are given there? And what two promises are given there? Through that atonement. Yeah, a sure reward laid up for them in heaven. And then look at that next promise in C. What does that next promise in C say? Partaking of what kind of fullness of who? How? How does that happen? Through what? Okay. So then we get into D. As the Son partakes of the fullness of the Father... What else does it tell us about that? Do you believe it? It goes back to exactly everything we've been talking about this morning. Exactly. So, given everything, the teaching, as we look back at the teaching of Christ and how he taught the people, looking at uh, everything we've talked about this morning, you have to ask yourself the question, if I believe it, what is stopping me from doing it? Okay. Well then, okay, say that again. Okay, the conviction is an important part of that because while you may know of it, are you convicted of it? Mark, did you have your hand up? Or okay.
See, that's a Needs to be 365 days, not just in three days. Right? Yeah. Exactly. That's a great point, because, and this is what we'll close with, because your testimony, it needs to inspire others to have a testimony. Uh, Bruce Riley. That's true. That's a good point, yeah. All right, well, we're, we're done. We're done with class. Ready to go.